organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, this is also a motif finding related talk. Uh, what I want to do today is introduce you to a new platform that we have for associating sequence features with uh, annotations that we can put on regulatory sites, so labels that we put on sites in, in any given genomic analysis. Um, so this method is called Sequenminder. It's not yet published. Uh, we have a bioarchive um, preprint up. But I'm going to demonstrate and motivate it in the context of some data that we published earlier this year with Esteban Mazzoni on uh, direct motor neuron programming. So what we're interested in, uh, the system that we work on with, with Esteban, uh, who's at NYU, by the way, um, is motor neuron programming where we're taking pluripotent cells and overexpressing a particular combination of three transcription factors, NGN2, ILET1, and LHX3. Um, and we get out spinal motor neurons um, at the end of this process. So we get to the same point from the same starting point as you would in development or in directed differentiation protocols that use morphogens to push you down a developmental pathway. But uh, I want to stress that we get um, there much more efficiently and much more quickly than the best uh, directed differentiation approaches. So we have almost complete uh, efficiency in terms of the homogeneity of the cell types that com uh, come out of this process versus this. Um, in previous work, we've shown that these are real motion neurons. We can uh, implant them into chick spines, and they will extend axons out of the, uh, the spinal cord and contact muscles and drive muscle activity. In work that I'm not showing here today, we also have single cell data showing that the process, the conversion process, is quite linear and uniform, um, we think synchronous. Um, so because of the high efficiency and this uniformity, um, we think this is quite a good model of transdifferentiation, of, of direct conversion of cell fate via the overexpression of transcription factors. So what I'm interested in is what the transcription factors that we're overexpressing are doing in this system, how they're bringing about this uh, conversion of cell fate. Um, although we call it a direct programming approach, uh, it's not exactly direct. It's not a one-step process. There's um, most of the repression that happens happens quite soon after overexpression of the uh, transcription factor module, but there are several waves of induction of genes within this short time course. So again, the question to us is what these uh, transcription factors that we've overexpressed are doing with respect to these genes that are getting activated at different time points. So there's a couple of models that we can think of for how these factors interact with the existing chromatin landscape that they find in the S cells in, in the starting cell type. Um, these factors, for example, could be pioneer factors. They could find their final regulatory sites uh, immediately, like early in the expression um, process, and stay bound there throughout the time course. Alternatively, there could be some stepwise process at play where they initially bind accessible regions and only later migrate to their final motion neuron enhancers. So we wanted to investigate this. We used ChIP-seq to do so. So what I'm going to show here uh, to begin with is just two of the transcription factors, ILET and LHX3, at an early time point in the conversion process. Now, as you can see, these factors bind quite uh, closely together. We think that they're forming a heterodimer um, at all of their sites. Uh, here's about 12,000 sites here. And what you can also see quite clearly is that I've split these sites out based on the pre-existing chromatin context in the ES cells. So half of the sites are accessible according to TACSEQ or are marked with uh, enhancer-related histone modifications, and half of these sites are not. So we can infer or at least hypothesize that these, at this set of sites, these factors are binding as pioneer factors. They're opening regions that were not accessible, at least according to an, an accessibility assay. So to summarize this, we can mark half of these, we can label half of these sites as being active in ES cells, we can label the other half as being inactive in ES cells. At this point in a regulatory genomics analysis, we're typically interested in what sequence features go with these labels, right? So in a situation like this, it's quite simple. You would maybe just separate this half of the sites from this half of the sites and run them through meme, or you could um, explicitly do a, a discriminative motif finding one label versus the other label. When the labels are mutually exclusive, and when you have only two labels, it's quite an easy process. There's a lot of good tools out there to do that. This isn't all we had for this project. We also looked at the time course behavior of these transcription factors. Again, these factors, ILET and LHX3, bind together. I'm only going to show LHX3 from now on because they, they look identical in terms of their plots. But from here, you can see that there's a set of sites that are only bound early by these transcription factors 
that go away during the, the uh, conversion process. There's another set of sites that are bound constantly throughout the conversion process. There's yet another set of sites that I find most interesting that are only bound late in the conversion process. So the reason I find this interesting is that these sites, I already showed you that there's some potential for these uh, factors to have some form of pioneering activity. And yet, these sites cannot be bound until later in the process. So again, we're really interested in sequence features that might be associated with these labels, um, early, shared, late, uh, in terms of their binding. Um, and again, as long as these features are defined mutually exclusively, there are approaches you could think of using. There are not that many approaches out there for doing multi-class um, motif finding, but there are a few, uh, especially coming out of Christina Leslie's group, for example. Um, Again, as long as uh, these labels are mutually exclusive, there are approaches you can think to, to take. But again, what we have now are two sets of regulatory annotations. So what we have in effect are um, six sets of sites that we can define with combinations of these uh, annotation labels. So now each of these um, labels are not mutually exclusive of one another. There's no one set of sites that we can take out as being representative as of one of the labels. And what we're interested in are features associated with the labels, not with the subclasses. So the reason this might be a little difficult to do is when there are uneven overlaps between the labels. Let's look at our late sites here, for example, um, which, again, I, I'm, I'm interested in biologically. Um, why uh, most of these late sites are inactive in ES cells. So if we look for features associated with late binding, we may just get features or confounding features that are really associated with inactive sites in ES cells, right? And you can play that game with any of these other sets of sites. There's uneven overlaps with uh, pre-existing activity or inactivity. And this is representative of a problem, you know, in other analyses that we'll talk about later, I guess. So we came up with this approach, this hierarchical classification approach to handle scenarios like this when we're interested in the features associated with these labels, but all we have are uh, subclasses defined by o overlapping sets of these labels. So this is called SQL Minder. Um, it's based on a logistic regression framework that uses camera models, um, estimates camera models for each of these subclasses. But there's a hierarchy in the model where we're also at the same time estimating features, camera features associated with the labels. And the way this works is that we have a, an L1 regularization term down here that encourages the sequence features in the subclasses to be consistent with the sequence features in the label models. So to, to boil it down, what we're really doing is um, you cannot find a sequence feature associated with a label here unless it's enriched in all of the subclasses that have um, that label. OK, so um, we also have quite a simple way that I wanted to mention to, to convert these camera models. What we get out of the model are full, sparse camera models associated with each label and subclass. Uh, there's a neat way to convert that into interpretable motifs, where we just um, scan those models over regulatory regions and then do focused uh, local motif finding. I know we're not the first to think of this. Um, Christina Leslie, again, has done this in, in some of her work, and I think this is how uh, Anshul Kandaji converts his neural networks into interpretable motif features, but it's a, it's a neat and easy way to, to get um, motifs out of camera models. Okay, so let me come back to our problem here, and we're going to analyze this set of data with these labels, and what we're interested in is finding sequence features associated with these labels. If we were to use uh, the, the straightforward approach here, which is a multi-class classifier, um, where we do not have the L1 regularization that, that uh, I, I showed you for SQL Minder, there's very um, unclear results with respect to associations between motifs and the labels. So again, this is a straightforward multi-class classifier based on camera models, just without the L1 regularization that I showed you. Uh, we get various motifs out here, but look at, say, the one-cut motif. Um, the, this model would find it associated with both late and ES inactive sites, just like I told you might be a, an issue with um, incomplete overlaps or, or, or overlapping annotations like this. However, when we use a SQL Minder, you can now see that the associations between labels and motif models becomes quite clear. So again, we find many of the same motifs, but now this model finds um, or thinks that, say, the OCT4 motif is specifically associated with early binding sites. Um, the cognate motif itself is more associated with the shared sites. So these uh, shared sites might have more 
maybe stronger um, cognate motif instances. And the one-cup motif comes out again, and now it's very cleanly associated with late binding. So this proposes a hypothesis, right, that the late binding sites um, not only contain one-cut, but perhaps they're dependent on the presence of one-cut transcription factors for binding to, to take place at those late sites. So we wanted to set out to, uh, to assess this hypothesis. First thing we found or noticed was that uh, all of these one-cut transcription factors are upregulated uh, late in the programming process. Uh, so we wanted to look where they were binding. So again, we used ChIP-seq to, to look at their binding, and late in the programming process, there's a much higher overlap between one cut uh, transcription factor binding and the late sites than there is with the other types of sites. So that's um, indicative, that's supporting evidence for our hypothesis, but again, it's not causal. So uh, what we'd really like to do here is knock out all of these transcription factors and see if, these, uh, if this binding goes away, the late binding goes away. For various reasons, we couldn't get to that point where we could knock out all three transcription factors in, in one cell type. Um, so we fortunately found a, another way around this where, where we got to the same point. I haven't talked about the NGN2 binding yet. That's our third uh, programming factor in our recipe. Um, it's pretty much independent in its binding sites from where ILS and LHX3 bind. And this independent binding pattern is pretty much conserved when you only express NGN2 in ES cells without the other two transcription factors. So we get pretty much the same set of sites uh, bound. Now, interestingly, if we only express in NGN2 alone, well, first of all, we don't get motor neurons, but we do get expression of one cut um, in these cells. If we only express ILS and LHX3 together, we don't get motor neurons again, and we don't get uh, one cut expression. So one cut gene expression seems to be dependent on NGN2 activity in, in our system. So if we look at... Um, the binding of, the pro of these programming factors, the ILS and LHX3 programming factors, in the context um, without NGN2 um, present, so again, without pre NGN2 present, we don't have the one-cut transcription factors present, and we get um, depletion, significant depletion of these late binding sites within this context at the same time point. Uh, when we reintroduce one-cut back into the recipe, we get decent rescue of these uh, one-cut um, coincident sites. So this just is, is evidence that our, our hypothesis that was generated from, by this motif finding platform uh, was borne out. Okay, so here's our, our overall model for this system. We have um, some sites, some, some chromatin landscape in ES cells. We believe that the programming factors are coming in here and pioneering some sites, but also just taking advantage of existing sites, perhaps even uh, collaborating with OCT4 at some existing enhancers. And then NGN2 comes in and activates some other genes, including the, uh, the one-cut genes, and then together one-cut collaborates with uh, LHX3 and ILS to find some final motor neuron specific enhancers and finish the programming process. So, um, so this was one example where we've, where we've used SecoMinder. How am I for time? Am I running out? Two minutes? So, so I did want to stress that this is a general motif finding platform um, where you may have very different types of regulatory annotations that, that you care about, right? Um, one that we've we spent a lot of time worrying about is promoter proximity. Um, for different sets of regulatory sites, um, there are different degrees of promoter proximity. Uh, this is really highly present you know, when we start looking at tissue-specific and tissue unspecific, uh, shared enhancers. Um, so for example, we can look at, say, um, ENCODE transcription factor binding, where we can define sites as being tissue specific or shared. And the shared sites are very often, not always, but very often highly biased towards uh, known transcription start site annotations. So in other words, they're quite promoter proximal, within a few hundred base pairs of promoters often. So if we were to just look for features of shared binding sites without taking this into account, we're probably going to get features of promoters out of our motif finding analyses. So when we, we can account for this potential bias in, um, in the SecoMinder platform by just integrating promoter proximal and distal labels. And then when you do that, you get rid of a lot of the promoter specific sequence features um, and actually what we end up getting out often associated with the shared binding sites are cognate motif instances. 
So again, we, we think, and this is all documented in much greater detail in the, uh, in the preprint, but we think that these shared sites are uh, associated with cognate binding, with higher strength of cognate binding motifs as opposed to just being, um, having GC richness or other um, promoter proximity features. Okay, so with that, um, please look up our code and our, our preprint. This is all work done by Akshay in my lab. He's a graduating student soon. Um, the motor neuron work is, is the product of a long-running collaboration with Esteban Mazzoni in NYU, and on that project, another collaboration with uh, Uwe Oler. Thank you. One quick question about the early factors. Yeah. So OCT4 definitely doesn't bind in the non-open chromatin region. So we does, OCT4, does OCT4 not bind in the non-open? Non so you showed open and non-open. I'm just wondering, OCT4 is anywhere there in ESLs. Yeah. So do these factors go and take advantage of it, and that kicks off the program? Yeah, you're right. so, so thank you. Good question. So we've defined the open regions based on basically the ESL, um, the ES cell type. So the regions that are, that are bound by OCT4 are typically open in that same cell type. Um, interestingly, so our, so our prediction here is, I mean, obviously ES, um, sorry, OCT4 is a feature of ES enhancers, right? That's undeniable. But our model was associated, associating it specifically with the early binding and not just general ES activity, right? So um, according to that, we could predict that maybe OCT4 and is, is recruiting LHX3 and ILH to those sites. And maybe even that OCT4 would move to some sites with LHX3 and ILH based on that. And we see some evidence for that, but it's pretty weak in our, so we haven't really stressed it, but yes. This is a quick question. I really like the idea to use the seek and binder to uh, deconvolute, for example, TSS proximity and the motifs that we all know are associated with TSS uh, sites. So in your slide, you did not specifically add such motifs, but if you added, let's say, the Tata box or s uh, these motifs, would they automatically be segregated into the correct proximal class and be removed from whatever other classes there are? And related to this, did you also try this for CPG islands? So, thanks. Um, all of these motifs that come out are just de novo products of the, of the motif finding platform. Um, we're not specifically adding in features them, uh, themselves. Um, so if they're not specifically associated with one of these classes, we'll never see them in there in the first place. Um, I'm, thinking of, I'm wondering if we could, as you say, add in a motif later or at least look for camers that are in our model still that are associated with those. We haven't actually tried that yet. point um, yeah so in yeah in this run there would have been no distinguishing features yeah you're right I don't know do you think that the um, the, the chromatin remodeling that happens in the late stage is replication dependent and do you think that that has anything to do with the level of synchrony in your system? Yeah, we haven't actually looked specifically at cell cycle in, in this context. Uh, they go through at least two rounds of division during the programming process. Um, so potentially, um, but it it's definitely re requires the activity of, of the one cut factors. When we repress one cut in any way that we can try or that we've tried you don't get the, the full conversion process happening. Whether that's uh, cell cycle dependent or not, we don't know yet. Thanks, that was a very clear talk, very nice. Okay, thank you. Thank you.